大家好，呃，今天的演讲就以英文为主 ，so like let's start with the English part. Um, so I'm gonna talk about、uh, how to like interop Java and Groovy. So you have a Java application and you use Groovy scripting to allow users or customers to like give you very advanced customizations or like user scripts.、Um, can I have like to show who uses Groovy or who knows what Groovy is about? Who has used Groovy to show?、Uh, okay, sound good, good, good.、Um, Has anyone ever used the Groovy extension module? No.、Oh, perfect. You're in the right talk.、Um, so, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm just gonna skip through the introduction. So, let's see how far we get in the next ten minutes, because we're already a bit late. So,、um, so why do we wanna use Groovy, and why do we wanna use Java, and why do we wanna combine the two? So, most of us here are probably Java developers, and、uh, there's many good reasons for. Being a Java developer, even nowadays, like there's Groovy, there's Scala, there's lots of alternatives, but Java still has its its strong points. But for example, if we want、uh, customers to to write simple codes to、uh, to、um, to plug into our application, or if we want to focus on code that is supposed to be very simple rather than easy to read or、uh, very fast, then we might want to use Groovy for that.、Um, so let's look at the code. Um, so, for anyone here who has a computer, you can go to this URL and download the demo application, and you can play with it right away. You can play with it later today. And so, to know what we're talking about today, I'm just going to give you a quick demo. So, this you don't have to copy this specific application. It's just、um, the best example that I could, could come up with. So here we have some sort of Java beans, and we want to show it as a table. But we don't know how the user or how the customer wants this table to look like. So in this case, we give the user a, a Groovy table. Like I write Groovy script like this, and I can decide how my table should look like. So this is just Game of Thrones episode, and I can easily script how I should want it to look like. Season episode, maybe pet too.、Um, So as you can see, I can basically write my own script, and then that defines how the table looks like. Now, you could, in your, for example, if you're more in the business area, you might want to allow a customer to provide custom HTML templates or any kind of custom logics that they can plug into your Java program. So you have your very well-developed Java program, but you want to allow users or customers to sort of plug in their custom code. All right, we, we can play with this later. So if you open the demo project, you can also check for the to-do markers, which will help you find、uh, the different topics that we're going to talk about here.、Um, so let's look at Java first. So if if we use Groovy, we also basically use Java and all the Java APIs. So if you look at the first line, this is any Java developer can read that. The only thing that's missing is the semicolon.、Uh, if you look at the second line, we already see this is this is not Java anymore. This is the, the Groovy extensions, which allow us to easily run.、Uh, Commands from a string, and then if you look at the third one, this is this is not Groovy. This looks weird. Like, do we think that this can work? For example, the last one, Taiwan dot Pinyin.、Um, so if I go back here, so this object here, sorry, is a string object, right? Java API, we all know that, but magically it has. But it magically has this pinion method or pinion property, which gives us the pinion for,、uh, for our Chinese characters.、Uh, and I'm going to explain how we did that. So this is basically called an extension module, which Groovy itself is actually using to to add、uh, string methods. For example, execute here, and, and to do that, it's quite easy. We just use the Java Util Service Loader mechanism. To add、uh, a Groovy extension module, and this is quite easy because we just define, for example, the first method. We define a pad function, and so it's a static function, and the Groovy engine will automatically load our Java methods from the class we have defined in the extension module, and then make the, that、uh, that function available、uh, as if it's part of of that object. For example, the The string method here, the execute method of the string object, is actually defined in a Groovy extension module just like this, 
And so the first argument is always the, this object itself, and then we can basically write our own Java code that is then available as a Groovy property. Um, for example, here the path function is just a normal typical function. It takes one argument length, but Groovy will automatically pass the, the self, the, this, the number object. And for example, the pinion, now when we use it, we can just write pinion because Groovy will automatically uh, change the Java getter method to a Groovy, Groovy property. So this is how we can easily add methods or properties to any Java object or any Groovy object or any of our own domain specific objects. And what's really cool about this is it's part because it's loaded via the Java Util service loader, you can, if you write your own extension module and you just build a jar, you can add it to the class path and then any other Groovy program will magically know about your Groovy extensions. So if you use Groovy console to develop, you can just add that jar and your, your magic method will suddenly be available. Uh, the next one is how do we uh, change runtime behavior? For example, uh, if we use Groovy and we run our Groovy script, if a variable, if we use an undefined variable, Groovy will just hiccup and say, oh, missing property exception. So it will, it will break our program. Now, if we have some sort of domain specific language or like user defined script, we might want to have something less severe, we might just want to default. If you use a variable that doesn't exist, we just give you null. We just either come up with a value or we just come up with some default value. And for that, we can use the Groovy script base class. So if, it, if the default base class is basically, it just throws an exception if the property doesn't exist. But if we provide our own uh, script base class, then we can completely overwrite that behavior and do whatever we want. For example, in this, very simple case, we just return null instead of throwing an exception, which might be easier for the user to deal with. For example, if a simple user doesn't want to deal with try catch blocks, we can just check variable equals null and then do this or that. Whereas if, if we have an exception, then for beginner programmers, they might not understand the concept of an exception, which can break the program flow. So it depends on what we want. So we can actually change the behavior of how Groovy works just by writing some Java code and providing, like, via an API. Um, there's also some other easy things that we can do to make life easier for someone who uses our Groovy scripts in, in, so for example, if we have a Groovy script that makes heavy use of math functions, we might want to predefine the import for uh, java.lang.math.star so that people, instead of having to write math, they can just use square root. Like, they can directly access as if they had imported uh, that object's methods. So for example, in Java, only classes in java.lang are automatically imported. Now in Groovy, there's a lot more classes, like java.util is also imported by default. But if we have our own script, we might want to import our own domain-specific business logic by default, so we can use this as well to make it easier, basically, to, to reduce the boilerplate for people that use our use our scripting. Um, there's another thing that we can do to deal with um, dynamic execution. So for example, in, in this example, if a property doesn't exist, we just return null. But that might not be very user friendly. So in this example, we might we define our own sort of undefined null object. It's not really null, it's an object, but it, it, ha it means nothing. And on this special object, you might have seen that from other scripting languages, you can do anything. You can call any method and use any property, but instead of giving you an exception that this method or property doesn't exist, it actually calls our get property or invoke method methods, which then do whatever we want. So you can dynamically override any method or dynamically provide any kind of method. So for example, in the, the second example, assuming that x is our special undefined object, if I call the x property, it will just run my code and give you a new object. So it will never actually break. You can write any kind of code, but it will never break, but it will also never do anything. It will just sort of build together this error message. Um, so there's another thing we might want to do. If, if we write Groovy, we know that we have the Groovy truth. So for example, null values, um, empty string, empty array, zero, all these um, types or objects 
are considered to be the same as false. That, that's different from Java. But if we write our Java code and we have a user who gives us some sort of groovy object, we might want to convert whatever groovy object we have. What would the groovy truth be for that? Because we are working in Java code. And for that, we can use the default type transformation methods from the groovy API. So this is, this is pure Java and we get the Boolean value that is that how groovy would interpret this object. And the type transformation uh, cl uh, methods are actually very useful also for uh, changing groovy closures to Java interfaces. So if your user, if your customer provides you a groovy closure, you can cast that to a Java interface, which you then use as any other Java interface in your code. Um, another thing is how to use groovy default methods. For example, if we look at number one, at the second line, this is what our groovy code might look like. But if we're working in Java and we only have, we are only given this groovy closure from the user, how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we sort of recreate the second line of the groovy code in Java? And for that we can use the default groovy methods. Again, a uh, class with only static, static methods that map to what would otherwise be called in groovy. So we can, instead of parentheses one to 10, we can use the, the groovy int range. And then we use the default groovy methods find all, which then maps to the same find all groovy methods that we know. So we can call all the groovy API and functionality from our Java code. Um, and last but not least, the builder pattern in groovy is very powerful and very convenient. Uh, but if we wanna, for example, if we want a user to write some HTML or XML and make it very convenient, it might, there might be a lot of boilerplate. For example, in section number one, this is the groovy code to, to build some HTML. Now the HTML business logic is, is very simple, but we have this boilerplate before and after. The string writer, the groovy XML markup builder, this is something we don't want our scripting user to see. We would like to, because this is not important for them. He just wants to write, H, he wants to write a template that gives us HTML. So what we can do is we, we again provide our own Java method that is then available in the groovy context. We take a closure as an argument, but because of how closures work, they, they are executed in a given context. But here in this case, we actually want to call the closure that is given by the user by an object that we ourselves define here at the markup builder. So what we can do is we take the, the closer object, we call the rehydrate method, which means we can actually change the context in which the closure is called. And that allows us to, to kind of change the behavior of the closure. All right. And I actually managed to finish in time. So if there's any questions or if we, please ask. Otherwise we can play with the demo application until time runs out. All right. So for example, if when I showed the, so this is the example of, of our table. And if I use an, a variable that is not defined, instead of getting an exception or a null value, I get a, an object that where, whose two string method is just undefined. And if I call, I can call any object or any method or property, hello, and it will just sort of build this object for me as I call methods that don't exist. And this is implemented, for example, like right here. So whenever I call a method that doesn't exist, I just call a new, create a new object that and add the, the property name that didn't exist. So it's actually quite easy, I can sort of build quite advanced sort of constructs for the users with actually very little code on my side. So this, this gives me a lot of power. Um, now why should I use Groovy over, for example, JavaScript is exactly because of these features. Because even though JavaScript is built in, 
um, it might actually be very difficult to write sort of concise, simple code in JavaScript. Even just loops are sometimes not as easy as they should be. And especially Groovy is, is very useful for any kind of list transformations, any kind of loops. Um, it's just very concise and very powerful. And with these uh, constructs like adding default methods, uh, adding custom fi customized functions, it makes it for you as a developer very easy to sort of extend that scripting environment that you give to the user. All right. All right. How to call Groovy? Oh, okay. So, for example, um, let's make this smaller. So here is how um, this is the compiler configuration object for the. We don't really we don't need it unless we want to provide our own default imports. But this is where it gets interesting. This is basically a standard JSR223 scripting engine. It, it might as well be a JavaScript scripting, in risk, link, uh, JavaScript scripting engine. And the, the reason why we have a little bit of extra code is here is because we want our own default imports um, so that we, we don't need to import certain functions or methods. And we also provide our own custom base class. So for example, like I showed you the this example where I basically call undefined objects. Um, so for example here, if you call x here, if this x doesn't exist, so I get a missing property exception, and instead I will provide this undefined object which just doesn't do anything regardless of what I call. But to show the alternative behavior, since my script base class has this, I can actually change this behavior by, by setting it. So if I set separate, Property exception, false. So if I now call an undefined object, I will actually get an exception instead of just a, a random object. Whereas if I change this to true again, I will again get this undefined object. So you have full control at runtime of how your script works and what happens when the user calls certain variables that may or may not exist. And for example, just um, allowing this kind of extra properties is actually quite easy. I just define the method and it is then available in my script as if it's a, a static function.